Hello folks and welcome to this, another program in our current series, Tracking Through Romans. As we delve, as we dive in and seek to mine and exploit and understand and eat the riches of God's grace, righteousness and redemption revealed in this book of Romans. Today we're going to look at something, a word in particular, and that word is justification, justified. But let's start by reading a scripture. And the scripture is, let's start in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through to verse 23. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe, there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now last week we looked at righteousness apart from law, specifically the very righteousness of God apart from law. And how God has revealed his righteousness and made his righteousness available to us, given his righteousness to us. So we stand in a new place in relation to God as being righteous as he is. Not with a righteousness of our own based on our behavior, our good conduct. But actually God's own righteousness, purely on the basis of a gift. And as we carry on in this chapter, this next verse, verse 23. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, as we've already determined, there is no one righteous, no not one. Under law, we are not righteous. If I'm to be judged according to my behavior against the law of God, well, I'm not righteous. I'm guilty. I have broken God's law in terms of externals. And I continue to break God's law. Now, I'm not using that, saying that, as an excuse to do wrong or to do evil or to behave in a moronic or bad manner. But it is a simple fact. We are born in this fallen world and we have broken God's law. And we continue to break God's law until we, are full, we experience the full effect of redemption until the power of the gospel has outworked all of redemption in us through the re complete res restoration of our soul, mind and body, even as our spirits are now redeemed. Now, on the basis of being guilty before God, in terms of me and you having sinned, this verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, what is falling short of the glory of God? Well, that would be nothing less than falling short of God's original design and purpose and plan for your life. God has got very good intentions for each one of us. In terms of God's view of our life and God's plan for our life and what God wants us to experience and partake of 
It's pure goodness. Pure provision. Flowing from the exceeding riches of His grace and goodness. In terms of God's purpose for your life. There is a purpose for your life. A wonderful purpose for your life. There, God has plans for you to live a productive life. God has plans and put in place people who you're to grow relationally with in love and in friendship where your whole life is enriched. These are God's plans. These are God's purposes. And they're all coming out of his goodness. God has plans that in terms of your purpose in work, that you would live a productive, fulfilled life, whether it be in a ministry context, and you share the riches of his grace and goodness with others. Or in your career and work life. That your life would be wholly enriched with God's goodness. In order that you would display the original design of God. Out of all the gifts and talents that he has given to us. But it says here, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, we can have a gift, or we can be talented at something, for example, but use that in a wrong manner. The world is full of gifted people who do not use their gifts to glorify God, to bring honor to God. Rather, they are using their gifts for selfish, selfish means. And that's across the whole boards, the whole spectrum of every genre and echelon of society. That there is a fallen condition, departed from God's original design, where people's gifts are being prostituted. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we fall short of God's glory. On a continual basis, we fall short of God's plan and what he has destined for us. But there's good news. We may have fallen, but there's one, there's a higher power, one who lifts us up into the true experience of God's purpose and design for your life. And it isn't on the basis of of how good or how strong are you getting it together in order for you to elevate yourself back into God's original design. There is good news. Now, this verse, again, let me read it again, but I'll read the whole thing. And we're going to look at what has happened. Verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Again, spend about a week just meditating on that verse alone. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. First of all, what does the word justification mean? Justified. Well, it's simply a legal term. So, if I'm taken to court and I'm, I'm being accused or prosecuted for you know, theft, for example, and... The judge looks at all the evidence and the prosecution uh, put forth their case. The, my defense comes forth and puts forth their case on my behalf. And the judge weighs it all up or the jury weighs it all up. And they declare me not guilty. I then am declared justified. I'm not guilty. I'm innocent. I've been justified. Now, in the case of what this is talking about, we are guilty in accordance with 
our inability to keep the law. For all have sinned. But the good news is God in Christ has declared us not guilty. Now this is an amazing fact. That God has declared us not guilty in Jesus Christ. Which means despite what we have done. And it clearly says all have sinned. Despite that fact, despite the fact we are guilty and therefore deserve prison, we're declared not guilty. We're declared innocent freely by His grace. So, the consequences of us sinning, we fell short of the glory of God. We fell short of God's experiencing and living in the purpose and plan and wonder of what God had purposed for us because of our sin. But God in Christ has come along and picked us up and placed us before himself in his glory in a place of innocence. We are declared innocent. We are justified. We are made innocent freely by his grace. Now some of these terms, like the term justification, because people read this very quickly, they don't often fathom what that means for them. The fact that we are in a place of innocence, you, my brother, you, my sister, are innocent before God as you stand right now. It's the good news of innocence given to you. Yes, you may have failed in so many ways. And you may be failing in so many ways right this moment. And you may fail in so many ways in the future. But right this moment and into the future, into your endless future, you are innocent before God on the basis of a gift. You're innocent before your Heavenly Father. He sees you only as innocent. Which means you can and now are in a place of elevation before God. You didn't elevate yourself through your own ability to fix yourself and put things right with yourself. God has elevated you through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus died our death. Jesus became sin. Jesus stood in our stead, bearing the consequences of our corrupt living. Entering into every aspect of who we are in a fallen state. And in that identification with us, he has identified us with himself in his innocence. God has restored us to our original state. Consider for a moment Adam and Eve before the fall. It says they walked in the garden of Eden and they were naked. And after the fall, they realized they weren't naked and they felt guilt. They felt guilty. And they're, they're But what had they done wrong? Was it why were they feeling guilty because they were naked? They shouldn't be feeling guilty because they were naked. Obviously it was because of the knowledge of good and evil that they had partaken of in their thinking. Allowing their minds to absorb and eat the knowledge of good and evil. But in their original state they were naked and they were in a condition of innocence. Now am I saying we should be naked, walk around naked? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying take your clothes off. But I am saying we can be completely transparent about everything we are. Our weaknesses, our strengths. We don't need to hide. We don't need to pretend. And we don't need to try and hide behind fig leaves in order to cover our own inadequacy, our own nakedness. The fig leaf of religion or the fig leaf of our own works, where we are tr trying to cover our own <clears throat> inadequacy. 
And this is what the picture of Adam and Eve can really bring forth. When they fail in the garden, uh, they immediately went and hid in a bush and sewed fig leaves together and tried to hide from God. And what were they trying to hide? Well, they were trying to cover themselves up. And how would that be applied to us today? Well, that would apply to us today as we put forth our own efforts to try and cover our own nakedness in terms of cleansing ourselves from our own guilt and putting ourselves in a right place with God where everything's okay. No, brothers and sisters, everything is already okay between you and God because of the one man, Jesus Christ. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. We're all sinning. But we're innocent before God. So we can relax about our mistakes, our fallenness, and allow the pure glory of God's grace and power and the spirit of life to flow unrestricted. As we are honest about what we're doing, good or bad, but at the same time accepting that God has made us innocent with himself in the person of Jesus Christ. This is astonishing news. This is good news. Our innocence before God. Uh, I'm thinking about the Apostle Peter. And Paul had to rebuke the, the Apostle Peter in Galatians, the book of Galatians. Peter, uh, that great apostle of the faith. Peter, that great apostle of the faith, who had spent three years with Jesus and in Acts chapter 10 he received a vision of all kinds of unclean animals, pigs, reptiles, snakes, all types of beasts and animals that you are forbidden under Jewish law to eat. He received a vision from God commanding him to get up, kill and eat and Peter, in his religious mind, he, 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 it made him shriek. It made him shudder at the thought of eating these unclean animals because of his religious training to not eat such animals, not eat such uh, creatures. But after receiving this vision three times, the Lord commanded him, get up, Peter, kill and eat, and do not call anything unclean that God has declared clean and then men came from Joppa and he was commanded to go with these men and preach to the Gentiles and the application of the vision was that God had declared all peoples clean all peoples innocent and they were all recipients to receive the good news of Jesus Christ so he was meant to he was commanded to go and preach to these Gentiles, these non Jewish people, who instantly received the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and the Jewish believers there were astonished who accompanied Peter that this miracle of the these non Jews receiving Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit with the manifestation of power tongues. And the application was Later in Paul's life when he was in Antioch, as recorded in the book of Galatians, he began to withdraw from Gentiles because of other Jewish believers who had come from Jerusalem. Uh, and he was frightened, Peter was frightened of these believers and what they thought. So he began to separate himself, separate himself from these Gentile non-Jewish believers. And Paul had to rebuke him, declaring that you know that a man is not justified by faith, by the works of the law, in other words, keeping the Jewish customs, but through faith in Jesus Christ, whether it be uncircumcised or circumcised. So the Jewish circumcised believers and the uncircumcised Gentile believers, they are all justified through faith. There is no difference. And Paul had to explain this to Peter. But the point I'm making is the resistance 
of the religious spirit to the pure gospel of Jesus Christ runs deep in God's people today. People resist this message of goodness and grace and unconditional love in Christ Jesus. And therefore they miss the power that accompanies this message. There is great power. There is mighty spirit power. Mighty Holy Spirit power that accompanies this message of innocence before God in Christ Jesus on the basis of Jesus. So whatever you're struggling with brother, whatever you're struggling with sister, yes you may be doing wrong, but you've got innocence before God. You're not cut off before God. God is not withholding his love, his power, his acceptance from you. He's not ticked off at you. He is embracing you in the unconditional gift of his innocence, his free, freely justified by his grace. He has freely justified you. It's not something you did. It's something he did. Now I'm a little bit all over the place today, but my excitement at this amazing gift of innocence given to us, not on the basis of how good we are or what we've done, but as Paul had to rebuke Peter because of his resistance and his going back and in a very subtle way, not really, even though God had spoken to him years earlier and given him a vision that the Gentiles were clean, he was still reverting back in his mind to his old way of thinking that the Gentiles, the non-Jewish believers were dogs. They weren't really God's chosen people. And he had to be rebuked. God has chosen you, me, on the basis of grace. And he's declared you innocent, freely by his grace. What an amazing thought. But you are, you are, you are as white as the driven snow in innocence before God. There is no fault, no mark against you, even in the slightest way. That, that can only be received by faith. But that is God's word to you, that you are innocent as the driven snow before God. And it isn't on the basis of what you're doing or how you're behaving, good or bad. Now, this message does scare some, uh, some folks, because they think it's a license to sin. Okay, I do get that. But, if you accept the message as it's presented, as it's given, it allows you to enter in and experience the original design of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But this is the elevation. The elevator in to God's glory again. Where you experience the glory of God because of your innocence before God in Christ Jesus. So you can look away from your mistakes, you can look away from your failings and actually step into the elevator of God's innocence and allow the Father to elevate you into his presence where his glory and grace pours out and you experience restoration, peace, forgiveness in your soul and are set free from the damaging effects of feeling guilt and condemnation before God. This elevator frees you from condemnation, which is the effect of feeling guilty. You've been freed from guilt and condemnation through the gift of justification, through the gift of innocence before God. And that's a good analogy, that God's gift of innocence to you is your elevator into the presence of God, into the glory of God, into the original design. So you now stand in the original design of God's purpose for your life. If you think of Ephesians chapter 1, comes to mind. It says that, uh, <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, in the heavenly 
dimensions in the heavenly sphere, in the heavenly places, in the heavenly realms, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He has blessed us in the heavenly realms. So in reality, we truly have been elevated. And we've been elevated, brothers and sisters, through the gift of innocence given to us in Christ Jesus. <laughs> what a wonderful gift. What a marvelous gift. And as I'm going through this book here, this book of Romans, we're in chapter 3. And to be honest with you, if, if the part of the book we're in now, it's almost like I'm not going to be able to go through every verse because the book is so intensively rich with what I'm talking about today, each chapter and each verse. It goes in explaining detail. Now, some people may disagree with what I'm saying and I've, you know, I have had a bit of feedback from a couple of people. I've had some extremely positive feedback from many people, the majority of people I would say, but I have had a little bit of negative feedback and uh, they basically disagree with what I'm saying. And that's okay, no problem. But my point is, particularly to those people who disagree with what I'm saying, read the book of Romans for yourself. Read it slowly, take in what it's saying, and Paul goes into great detail about what this difference between law and grace and how we're justified freely without the law. We're declared innocent without the law. And your innocence before God places you in a, such a place of astonishing peace with God. Because your innocence isn't dependent on whether you've been, you may be guilty in terms of what you're doing, but your innocence is on the basis of how good Jesus is. Which means you now have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God. Therefore since we have been made innocent through faith we have peace with God. Through whom we stand in faith in this grace in which we now partake. So You have been declared innocent, freely justified, freely declared innocent through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this is the grace of God. 